Okay, thank you so much. So first of all, really, I'm really happy to be here. And I'll, I think my talk has a slightly different focus than the rest of the um, session, but I hope it's interesting nevertheless. So um, as, uh, as my title already says, I'll be talking about how multiple signals can be decoded by um, um, gene regulatory landscape of a gene um, with um, using the exist locus as a model. But first, if we um, take a step back, so we know in complex multicellular organisms, gene expression must be precisely tuned both in a temporal and spatial manner to generate these all these different types of cells that um, build the organism. And so in particular, developmental genes often have large cis regulatory landscapes, maybe because they need to interpret and um, um, decode um, multiple input signals. So these, what I now call input signals, are essentially sequence-specific transcription factors that are also present in a like, cell-type-specific manner, and that the, will then bind to distal regulatory elements and um, will somewhat cooperate to then tune um, gene expression and generate a complex expression pattern. Um, However, we know actually quite little on how these multiple signals um, are decoded and how you can generate kind of this precise um, regulatory logic. So we're starting to look at this in the context of the exist locus, uh, which is the master regulator of exon activation. And I'll show you in a, uh, in a, in a few minutes why I think this is a good, good model. But first, uh, just a short introduction. On, on, on exist and its function. So it's the master regulator of axon activation in mammals, which is the process that has evolved to ensure dosage compensation for X chromosomal genes between the sexes. So early during, during development, both X chromosomes and females, they are active. Um, and, to, and then later on, and in all somatic tissues, one of these two X chromosomes is essentially nearly completely silent in each cell. So this is initiated um, by, the, by EXIST, which is a long non-coding RNA, which will be upregulated during early embryogenesis from exactly one out of two X chromosomes in each cell. But um, the selection of which X will upregulate EXIST will is random. Then EXIST will code the X chromosome, recruit a variety of silencing complexes and lead to uh, nearly chromosome-wide gene silencing. The silent state is then inherited throughout all further cell divisions throughout the life of the organism. So EXIST has, as you can see here already, a quite a peculiar, peculiar expression pattern. So on the one hand, it's controlled um, uh, in a developmental manner because it's upregulated at a certain stage of uh, embryonic development. So in mice, this is at the, at the epiblast stage. And, um, it, but it's also controlled by, in a sex-specific manner. So it's only upregulated in female cells. And we know that this depends only on X chromosomal dosage. So this has nothing to do with the Y chromosome. All cells that have two X chromosomes will upregulate EXIST during differentiation. And finally, uh, EXIST shows this monoallelic expression pattern. So it's expressed from only one out of two X chromosomes in the same nucleus. So why is this now an interesting model to look at molecular decision-making? So we know we have two fairly well-defined um, signals that are decoded by the locus. So it's uh, differentiation, uh, development, and X chromosomal dosage. Then um, the exist locus can essentially sense a, um, a quantitative input. So an only twofold difference in X chromosomal gene expression and convert it into a binary all or nothing response. So exist will only be upregulated if we have um, a double dose of X-linked genes. And this um, exist expression state is then maintained um, in cis, uh, essentially uh, um, in, a, in a nucleus that senses the same, let's say transcription factors, but only one of the two X chromosomes will express exist. So in, this so in my lab, we are looking at all these different aspects, but today I'll focus on the first um, question, how these two e um, input signals are integrated. Um, because, yeah. So we know already quite a lot about 
um, exist regulation because this um, locus has been studied over many decades by, um, by many labs. And I'll just quickly introduce what we know about um, particular developmental regulation and ex dosage dependent regulation. So what you see here is the, um, the genomic locus where exist is located in mice, uh, exist is located here. And um, this whole region is called the axon activation center. So I, I colored here in blue and green or kind of known regulators of exist and blue, these are uh, negative regulators um, and green positive regulators. And most of these, uh, all of these here, they are also long known coding RNAs that largely act probably uh, locally in cis. So we know that this locus is divided in two topologically associating domains. So these are regions where chromatin preferentially interacts and where we think gene regulation occurs. And exist is essentially transcribed through the boundary of these two domains. So then you can see that the exist promoter is in the same domain as the, um, these known positive regulators. While in the in the in the um, while the repressing domain contains in particular this antisense transcript of exist called TSIX, which is a known cis repressor. So what do we know now about ex dosage dependent regulation? So we know um, the best, at least the only really well studied. Um, mediator of this process is this gene down here, RNF12, which is the E3 ubiquitin ligase, which will degrade an exist repressor, REX1, which binds, compete, potentially com um, competes with um, an activator, YY1, here at the um, exist promoter proximal region. Um, but we know there must be other regulators that, that are not known to date. So with respect to um, developmental regulation, this has mo mostly been attributed to pluripotency factors, which are thought to repress excess. As in um, naive embryonic, embryonic stem cells, these factors, they're all highly expressed, while exist is, is silent. And when, when these cells are differentiated, they, these transcription factors will be down-regulated and exist is up-regulated. So that's why um, it has, it's thought that these factors will trigger excess upregulation. And they bind um, to a prominent binding site within exist and also to this uh, antisense repressor TSIX. However, we know now that deletion of these binding sites, either here in exist or in TSIX, they will not lead to premature exist upregulation, suggesting that there must be additional uh, or other uh, mechanisms that control developmental regulation of exist. So um, to date, we don't know whether there is um, maybe our transcription factors that induce excess upregulation and then which of these genomic elements in, in exists regulatory landscape will respond to these factors. So to look uh, kind of systematically at um, how these two signals are decoded at the exist locus, here um, a, a PhD student in the lab, Til Schwemmle and the postdoc, Uta Hjaltema, they got together to ask really how are developmental cues and ex dosage information now decoded at the exist locus. And to do this, we, uh, we use essentially a cell model uh, that is uh, shown here on the slide, where we, on the one hand, we compare two different embryonic stem cell lines. So these are mouse embryonic stem cells, where on a female line with two X chromosome will upregulate exist when we induce differentiation. Um, by two I live withdrawal in this case. While um, another line, an XO line, which is a, just a subclone of this line but has lost one X chromosome, this will behave like a male cell because there's only one X chromosome and there will be no exist expression when we differentiate that line. So um, we, can, we can compare these two cell lines to, uh, to look at X dosage effects and we can compare the undifferentiated and differentiated states uh, to look at different uh, developmental regulation. And um, one important detail is that we use a, a, um, a mutant female um, ES line down here, which carries a large deletion essentially of the entire axon activation center on one of the two X chromosomes. In this way, all cells will upregulate um, this wild type, exist from the wild type X chromosome, which still carries the exist gene, 
and all kind of genomic profiling we do of that region will uh, will uh, show us the state of the exist expressing inactive X chromosome. Well, if we would do this in a in a um, wild type cell, we would always get a mixture of the active and inactive chromosome. So now, what uh, Till and Rutger did first. Till performed, um, performed a CRISPR screen to comprehensively identify functional regulatory elements of EXIST. And then um, they profiled essentially the activity, how the activity of these identified elements would be modulated by differentiation and X dosage within the cell model here. So the, um, the CRISPR screen um, essentially relies on the principle that we, we choose a series of candidate regulatory elements, um, which, uh, where we then recruit um, uh, through a dead Cas9 a rep crop repressor domain, which will um, deposit a tweak 9 trimethylation, which will lead to just to inactivation of this um, reg putative regulatory element. And if this now was, for example, an enhancer of exist, will, will lead uh, to reduction of exist expression. So, but we don't do this one by one, we do this in a pooled screen uh, fashion in a highly parallelized manner, as I will show you in the next slide. But the first step is that we had to find these putative candidate elements because we cannot screen the entire 800 KB region. So for this, we used um, uh, a taxi data to look at uh, accessible regions. We also performed an episomal reporter assay, StarSeq, and we included um, enhancers that had been identified by the Phantom 5 consortium. So this led to 138 candidate regions in, 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 the, in the Exxon Activation Center. Now, um, then we designed a, a sgRNA library that would target the, uh, these, these candidate elements with as many guides as possible. And this library of, of um, so these sgRNAs were cloned into a lentiviral vector, and then the library was transduced into a female ES cell line that already expresses this DCAS9 crop um, CRISPR I system. Now we have a population of cells where each cell, because each cell um, gets exactly one guide RNA, so each cell will silence one candidate element. Um, then, then we differentiate these cells and stain exist expression by flow fish um, to be able to sort cells according to exist expression level. So in this case, we sorted them in four different populations according uh, to, um, to, to their exist expression level. And then we sequence the genomically integrated um, guide RNAs and quanti quantify their abundance based on the, on the sequencing data. So, um, the principle here is that if you imagine you have a guide that will target an exist enhancer, the cells that, that carry that guide, they will show have lower exist expression level because the enhancer is inactivated, such that these cells will be essentially depleted from this exist high population here, and vice versa for a repressive element. So I will focus now only, I've shown you only data for the high, exist high population, to keep it um, a bit simple. So this is, this is the, essentially the results from the screen where you just see now the um, enrichment of, for each guide in the high population compared to the unsorted population. So each of these uh, smaller dots here, they represent one sgRNA and all these kind of rimmed um, circles, they represent a joint analysis of all sgRNAs that target one specific regulatory element. In blue, um, uh, these are enriched elements, so they're uh, repressive elements of exist, while in red, we have activating elements that are depleted from the high fraction. So I just want to point out, so maybe one thing we, we found essentially nearly all known um, regulatory regions of exist, in particular promoters of these, um, of these regulators, JPX, FTX, TSIX, RNF12, so technically, uh, the screen worked uh, really well. Then, as expected, with the by far the strongest effect uh, uh, we find at the excess promoter, 
But then we found uh, essentially the second strongest um, um, effect was found in this distal region here, which brought 150 or 140 kb upstream of excess, which has not had not previously been implicated in excess regulation at all. And here we found actually several elements that, that uh, had fairly strong activating effects on exist, suggesting that these might be long range um, enhancers. So now in the next step, we are gonna look, um, uh, analyze how in particular these two regions, um, uh, how they are affected by um, X chromosomal dosage and differentiation. And I will now zoom in just on that region and I'll ask you to focus essentially on these two. Uh, on these two identified elements. So um, first uh, data set I want to share is where we look at essentially an active histone mark by cut and tag. Um, both in red uh, is the XX cells and blue the XO cells. And we have look at day zero, so before differentiation and at day two in differentiated cells. So first so somewhat surprised to us was that at, at day zero, at least with the K27 acetylation mark, we already uh, looked like the exist promoters already active, but exist is not expressed in, at this stage. Well, uh, we start to see a difference uh, on uh, day two, where essentially this kind of activity or ac active profile is, is starts to be lost in XO cells, um, showing that there is, it seems to be mainly an X dosage dependent regulation uh, at the promoter proximal region because we see a difference between XX and XO cells, but, but we don't see a, a really a differentiation dependent change in, in XX cells at least. This is really different now in this uh, long range, uh, di in these distal regions, which are essentially in completely inactive. Before differentiation, and they, be, they get become active um, when, it, when we induce differentiation, but in both cell lines. Now, even the XO cells that don't upregulate exist, they will still seem to activate these distal enhancer regions. So um, we tried to understand a bit how these distal enhancers are now activated and looked for a tra um, transcription factors that might, might regulate these elements um, through this. We used the Cystrome database and found essentially several so prime pluripotency factors, so factors that get upregulated during differentiation um, that bind these enhancer elements um, prominently, for example, OTX2 uh, um, and SMA23. And we think that these factors essentially um, will, will activate these distal enhancers, but in an X dosage independent manner. Then we also looked uh, with cut and tag at uh, two repressive marks. So first, um, it's A3K27 trimethylation that we already so heard about quite a bit, um, where as uh, we see, and this has been actually uh, described uh, previously, that there's a large uh, domain of H3K27 uh, covering essentially all these distal um, elements and the a, a large region upstream of exist, uh, however, not the excess promoter. And this, we, we, this uh, domain is present in both XX and XO cells and is lost then gradually during differentiation, um, including um, these distal enhancers, um, suggesting that maybe um, loss of a 3 k 27 trimethylation might also contribute uh, to, to activating these regions. But again, the excess promoter is completely devoid uh, in, um, of this mark in both in all cases here. Now, we also looked at a 3 k 9 trimethylation, which shows a completely different pattern. It's a more associated, more uh, constitutive heterochromatin. And we only we see uh, it start being recruited um, specifically in XO cells and specifically at the excess promoter proximal region, um, suggesting that um, it might be important to prevent excess up, uh, expression in cells with one X chromosome. But uh, this also again supports the idea that the promoter proximal region is where we see um, X dosage dependent effects. Um, in this case, uh, act, uh, active repression of the um, in X, in cells with one X chromosome. So, um, so kind of to summarize these findings, we found that the uh, it looks like X dosage regulation and developmental regulation are really associated with distinct regulatory regions, where developmental regulation seems to be mostly. Um, 
um, um, uh, seems to mostly affect these distal enhancer elements um, but that become activated during differentiation but uh, in both cells with one and two X chromosomes. And this is, uh, might be an additional or maybe more important mechanism than repression by pluripotency factors as previously suggested. Ex-dosage dependent regulation, by contrast, seems to be focused on this promoter proximal region, which is an agreement what we know about this RNF12 factor that targets that region, and where we see, um, in addition, um, uh, some uh, recruitment of active repression um, during differentiation. So now in the, in the, the second part, I'll show you um, a bit more detail how we, um, we analyze these distal enhancers. And in particular that we found that there was in a um, previously unannotated um, long non-coding RNA there that um, seems to be involved in excess regulation. So we performed um, um, TTSeq, so just a, a method to look at nascent transcription. And uh, in the same you know, cellular cell model I introduced, and we found that here in this distal uh, um, enhancer cluster, they, um, there, there seems to be a transcript that is specifically upregulated during differentiation, but on both XX and XO cells. And in this region, previously there was no gene annotated. So, we, so um, since, as I'll show you, we think this is a positive regulator of EXIST, we named it um, EXERT for EXIST enhancing regulatory transcript. So we characterize this in quite some detail. Um, it's a uh, the, whole, the, the genomic region is around 50 KB. It forms a spliced and poly adenylated transcript, as you can see here with this um, RNA-seq data, the second line, um, and uh, which uh, um, yeah, are generating multiple really short isoforms. So these, the spliced um, RNA is less than one KB for all of these. Um, then, we now overlay this with the um, chromatin profiling data and the um, data from the CRISPR screen. You'll see that uh, this, this uh, transcript covers essentially four re, um, elements that were identified in the screen as positive regulators of EXIST. One of them here um, corresponds to the promoter of this transcript. And then three of these enhancer elements uh, lie within an intron of the transcript. So if I will call this promoter um, element now exert P for exert promoter and the enhancer cluster here exert E for exert enhancer um, cluster. So now we looked at the expression of this transcript first in embryonic stem cells where you see here it's upregulated during differentiation in both XX and XO cells, um, a little bit more in XX cells but it shows the upregulation shows quite similar dynamics to the upregulation of exist, suggesting that it might be involved really in the early initial upregulation of exist. And then later it rather starts to decrease again. Also, exist will be maintained then uh, essentially indefinitely. We also looked um, so in, in uh, published data in, from mouse embryos in vivo, and we found it, uh, it's expressed specifically at a quite a short developmental window between embryonic day 5.5 to 6.5, specifically in the epiblast. So uh, exist, uh, so random X inactivation is initiated in the epiblast at day five. So this is essentially the early first two days when exist is upregulated, exert is also expressed, but then later it again, it disappears. And we couldn't, so far we couldn't see its expression in any other, other tissue or context suggesting that might really play a role in, in initiating excess upregulation. So then we formed a lar quite a large number of kind of perturbation experiments to, um, to, to, uh, to study the, the functional role of the transcript and these elements. And I'll just share this one kind of data set here where we uh, generate heterozygous uh, mutant cell lines. So where either the exert P or the exert E region or both of them are mutated on one, uh, like deleted from one out of two X chromosomes in a, in a female ES line. And then we analyze the effect on exist by pyro sequencing down here, which gives you essentially a quantification of the, the um, 
the, the fraction of exist RNA that is arises here from the wild type X chromosome in this case, so the black six X chromosome. So you see that um, that um, exist and for all three mutants exist is prime preferentially expressed from the wild type X chromosome, showing that deleting these um, elements impairs exist upregulation in cis, but it's a, 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 it, it is not a complete effect. So they 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 boost exist expression, but they are not strictly required for exist expression. But if we compare now these three mutants, they look actually quite similar. And what is really clear is that the, the deleting both of them will not add up to a higher effect. Rather, um, the, the compound mutant seems to kind of be similar to, um, to the single mutant, suggesting that these, the, these elements, they don't maybe don't add, um, act independent from each other, but maybe in the same regulatory axis. So what, what we think uh, could be that the exert uh, promoter is what is required for a transcription of this, um, this transcript, and maybe trans transcription through these enhancer elements will contribute to their activation in this way. Um, these elements, they lie essentially in, in, in a kind of regulatory pathway. But what, you can really say from this data is that clearly this uh, exert promoter and enhancer, they activate existences. So then in the last part, we looked um, at a 3D conformation of the locus, because now if these, these uh, region is really a long range enhancer, we should see some kind of physical interactions with the access promoter region. So for this, we collaborated with the Mundlos lab uh, at, at our institute, specifically with Mike Robson and Robert Schöpflin, who performed a capture um, high C on the axon activation center, again, in our cell model with these, uh, um, with the kind of four different conditions. Here, I just show you um, the data in, in, in XX cells at day zero and day two. Um, um, what you see, at day zero, essentially the, the expected pattern that was um, found previously that we have these two topologically associating domains uh, with exist at the border. Now, at the, during differentiation, we see that this um, larger TAT um, here starts to be divided into two sub -tots so that now we have preferential interaction of the exist promoter, particular with this all this upstream region up to the exert locus. So, uh, which, which essentially, con so this is the region that contains all these uh, long range enhancers we identified and we now start to see a preferential interaction with that region. So to look at this a bit more uh, quantitatively, uh, I also have a subtraction map between the two uh, conditions. So it's essentially day two uh, minus day zero. So everything now that's red is higher at day two than in day zero. And you see that there's, from the excess promoter here, you see there is an increased interaction um, here in particular also with the exert region. So then we also compared XX and XO cells in a similar manner. Um, and, and now uh, in, at day two in differentiated cells, and we see that exist shows in, increased contacts with the entire upstream region here. So all these long range enhancers um, in XX compared to XO cells showing that um, there, is, there seems to be indeed increased context um, with exist of these long range enhancers, specifically in the context where exist is actually expressed, so in XX cells. So with this, um, this is the last data slide I want to share. Now I try a bit uh, to summarize kind of the model that emerges from these findings. So we have um, in, in undifferentiated cells, the, the state of um, in, in of XX and XO cells, so in males and females potentially, is, is very similar. So exist is not expressed. The exert region is repressed uh, by a 3 ketone 7 trimethylation. But the exist promoter region is already in a sort of active uh, conformation, but not driving expression. Now, uh, during differentiation, we see increased contacts of this um, exert region, uh, specifically in, in, in the females. 
uh, exist. Um, so exert will be upregulated. The enhancers are activated by um, specific transcription factors that are upregulated during the um, differentiation. And um, these distal enhancers can now drive or boost exist expression, but only here in females and in, in, in female cells where exist will be expressed. Because uh, in, in male cells, uh, the promoter region is repressed by this H3K27 trimethylation domain, which essentially may, seems to make the promoter insensitive to long range regulation. So we, yeah, to, to, um, this tells us that these developmental cues and X dosage are sensed by distinct regulatory elements. And that these, uh, the distal elements, they can drive strong exist upregulation, but only if this promoter proximal region is in a, in essentially in, an, in the on or in the sensitive state and not turned off in, in the in low X dosage condition. So suggesting that essentially there is somewhat a regulatory hierarchy between the promoter proximal and the distal elements that will allow a logic integration of these two signals that only if both signals are present, we get um, um, expression of exist. So with this, um, I'll come to my acknowledgements. So this is this is our lab who did a great job here, I think. So the work was led by Rutger Hjautema and Till Schwemmle, and also a big part was done by Pauline Kautz. And then I want to thank our collaborators here on the on the high C in the Mundlos lab. And of course, all, all our, our funders. So I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks a lot. Ed. a beautiful presentation and a very interesting setting. So we have time. Maybe I can start with, uh, with one question. So it's, it's not clear to me how the pairing is regulated between the answer, the exert, and, and uh, exist. Is that is driven by prepotency factor because you meant prepotency factor? And is that abrogated in when the promoter is methylated? That was in the male uh, case, right? When there is a mm -hmm. methylation, K9 trimethylation, then you don't see pairing. The, have you done some of yeah. these? Uh, so, you, so you mean the kind of the physical interaction? Exactly. The yeah, the looping, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so yeah, that's I mean, we don't we don't completely know, but um, so what we know is that the promoter. So, um, so somewhere in this exert transcript, so close to this enhancer cluster, there's a T CTCF site that seems to pair with CTCF binding in the excess promoter proximal region. And we know that uh, this promoter proximal region, we also get DNA methylation during differentiation, which might prevent CTCF binding specifically on the active X. And that's why we might have more contacts uh, on the inactive X where, where these, um, the CTCF binding is maintained. But we have, we have not looked actually at CTCF binding. So this is based on some other published um, um, findings. So the, actually that, that was also my other question. You didn't, you didn't um, so in your guide RNA library, do you, did you also have DNA methylation enzyme guide for, uh, you know, so what, I wonder whether the methylation is implicated in this process or CTCF mm -hmm. and coexist in, uh, mm -hmm. in this analysis. Yeah, I mean that's a question in the uh, a good question I think for this type of screen where we rely on K9 trimethylation to inactivate this. Um, um, the, the elements to what extent this will impact um, things like CTCF finding, which yeah, drive right. uh, 3D interactions. Yeah. So I think, I mean, there some from the literature that I'm aware of, you, it will not necessarily prevent um, CTCF binding if you do not target the Cas9 exactly. to the actual binding site. So exactly. I don't think we can really conclude from the screen on this question, but it's a really important question. Yeah. Okay. And I have also a question, a uh, great, great talk. Actually, you assess, your assay is assessed the expression of exist, right? Have you seen that the proper dosage compensation what is happening? Have you seen, for example, for gene activations and escapers, yeah. if you have keep the same thing? And this is the first question. The second question that I have, this, this uh, regulatory element exists, uh, that you have it also in males and females, right? What does it make different in females? Is it something, another mechanism that triggers the activation of this guy in females rather than males? Thank you. Yeah, so, so I guess these are, are two questions. No? So, so, well, with the males and females, 
so we haven't looked at this in detail, but we think it must be something about this promoter proximal region. And there are some ideas that this Rex1 is, we know it has a higher level in, in males because it's degraded in females. And then this somewhat leads to um, repression of the element. Now, how this can be this kind of binary switch is a question we're really interested in, but we don't really know. Um, the, the first question, because those is compensation related. If you oh, yeah, check yeah, for yeah. those is compensation yeah, so this is also, genes. Yeah, yeah. This is really important, but I have to say we haven't looked at it in this context. Actually, it, it's quite interesting because we these and distal enhancers, they just reduce the level of exist mostly. So we also looked at this in some more detail. I didn't show, but that you essentially get lower exist expression level, but the it exists will still be upregulated and the frequency of exist upregulation is more controlled by the promoter proximal region. Now, um, really interesting question is whether this reduced amount of exist does it have an effect on silencing or is it yes, somewhat important yes. to maintain expression? So that's something we now have all these mutant cell lines. That's something we want it's to look great. at that we haven't done yet. Yeah. It's great. So maybe I can jump in with a question from uh, from Bernie. I'm a bit biased. Bernie's from my institute, so you know, <laughs> Bernie Pryor, I'm sure, I know you, I'm sure you know it. So he's asking, do you know what is responsible for exist expression maintenance after exert is downregulated? And I add, I add to this, how exert is upregulated during between five, five to six days and how this is achieved, this specific regulation, yeah. Yeah, so how this is achieved, I mean, I went about, through this a bit quickly, but we think there is binding, for example, of OTX2, which is upregulated okay. specifically in, in that okay. time. And um, potentially it binds there also to, it binds together with, with OCT4 actually, but only in differentiated cells. And there's this nice paper from Joanna Vizoka's lab showing that this, uh, they, they OTX2 and o, um, OCT4 together, they drive gene, gene expression of a subset of genes in the prime pluripotent state. So we think this is, this is one of these genes. Okay. Um, the question how it's later maintained, I mean, first, there is the exert distal enhancers, and there are some other, like, for example, with, um, associated with FTX and also JPX, these other known regulators that we also find in the screen, and that have probably different dynamics, at least their expression is, is maintained later on, while exert is not. So now our, our screen is essentially a bit biased because it was performed at this early stage. So we find a really strong effect of the exert region at this early stage. So we think that probably this would look quite different if we look later on and that there are other elements that, that maintain, exp um, stay expressed. But also it looks like actually that exist early on is higher expressed and then levels will go down. So I think this is what this exert um, um, expression okay. does, but to what, what's the functional importance is still quite unclear. Okay. We have three questions, so you have to be quicker in reply. So at least we can give also the chance to everybody. In, uh, so maybe I can read the first one, Sarantis, you can read the second one. So the first one is Edda, how would you assess the off-target effect in your non-coding CRISPR screen? Very short. Yeah. Well, we have for, for each element, we have between 10 and 60 guides. So um, the, the variability is high in these screens, but uh, I think that's why we get actually quite a good statistics and the off-target effects are not such a worry, I think. Yeah. There's Saluiko for the, another one. Yes. We have a little bit of time. Yes. Uh, Ryan yeah. asked uh, elegant cell line system. However, uh, in the X6 cell line, Aren't important elements deleted that might be involved in counting sense in the number of X chromosomes? Yeah, yeah, actually based on some published data, these cells shouldn't even upregulate exist. Um, but um, it doesn't look like it. I mean, we did a, a detailed comparison of the mutant and the wild type, and you get nearly the same level of exist and the same, so around 70 to 80% of cells upregulate exist. So it doesn't look that there are any kind of trans elements deleted. But what we did not actually might need to point out, we did not delete the RNF12 gene for which it's known that it's required. So we just deleted up to that region. And in that, there doesn't seem to be in our system very important trans regulators. Okay, then we have another question from John Pook. If you were to introduce an active X chromosome from a differentiated male cell into a diploid XX female cell that had undergone to X inactivation, would the male X become inactive or remain active? 
should I read it again? Yeah, no, no, I understand, but it's it's a hard hard question to predict because we know that this X inactivation can happen during early differentiation, and there's something later on that will prevent it. So maybe this silencing of exist is actually permanent and not so easily reversible. But yeah, it's a it's very speculative. I think maybe maybe not, but um, I don't really know. Maybe the last one. Scientists want to read. Yes, uh, Patrick asks you actually, does the uh, third RNA itself play a role? Did you manage to target it in somehow? Or yeah, yeah maybe yeah, you that's did a... some chirp experiments or something with the RNA? Yeah, that's a hard question that touches on some uh, <laughs> problems we also had. So we what we try to uh, first to know whether at all the transcription or transcript plays a role to insert a, a polyadenylation signal to stop transcription which first looked like there was an effect on exist, but then we, when we did it in a really uh, carefully controlled manner, we did not really manage so easily to interrupt transcription with this poly A signal. So in the end, this data was inconclusive. It's still an open question. I mean, I don't, I mean, we, there's no conservation of the exons or anything. So my guess is that the RNA itself is not important, but we couldn't um, so far really address that question, but it's very interesting to us as well. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Ada. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay.